Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Mr. Sasebo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be looking at the effects of sharing electrons and molecules, specifically the geometries of those molecules. So the first thing you need to realize is that most molecules do not share electrons equally. So even though sharing is caring, covalent bonds are shared uh, pairs of electrons, that doesn't mean that all molecules share these electrons all the time and with equality. Instead, what we end up having a lot of the times is we have molecules where uh, the electrons spend more time around one atom and they spend less time around another atom. What that creates is a difference in charge. Now, it's not a difference in charge like, you know, the ions where we are looking at like, you know, I don't know, ammonium where you have NH4 plus and it's a whole, you know, plus one charge. It's a lot more subtle than that. So instead, you can kind of think of it like the more electronegative the atom is, the better at attracting electrons it's going to be. So it's going to pull a lot more, and that's going to give that atom more of a partial negative charge. So again, it's not a full plus or minus, and the reason why we kind of don't just put a plus or minus is because it is a partial charge. So this little lowercase d uh, in Greek, it's a delta symbol, but it's a lowercase, that's how we represent partial. So if it were like just a negative, that would mean, you know, an electron. But this is not uh, an entire thing. It's instead a partial negative charge. In other words, the electrons spend a little bit more time around here, and they spend less time around the positive part. And again, the less electronegative the atom, the, the less likely it is to attract electrons to itself and to be able to do that. So instead, that has a partial positive charge or a delta positive. Okay. So just by looking at these, you can tell the bluer parts here. Those are going to be the more positive areas, and the red parts, those are going to be the more negative areas. Now, most molecules, since they don't share electrons equally, they have a unique property, which we call a dipole moment. So a dipole moment is when a molecule is placed inside of an electric field, and when you put it in an electric field, you have the negative, uh, the partial negative charges attracted to the positive side of your electric field, and the partial positive attracted to the negative side of your electric field. So in other words, because you have this kind of like, you know, weird arrangement of partial positives and negatives, uh, you have this attraction that's happening, which wouldn't happen if you didn't have these partial charges. And so any molecule that has a dipole moment is called a polar molecule. If it doesn't, then it's called a nonpolar molecule. So when scientists, and obviously you've probably taken several science classes already, um, use the term polar or nonpolar, that's really what they're getting at. Polar things are attracted to electrical fields. Nonpolar things are not attracted to those electrical fields. In order to predict whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar, you need to be able to draw the Lewis dot structures for them, right? So that means that all that work we've been doing has an actual point. Now, the second step, if you want to know kind of if something's polar or nonpolar, you have to be able to predict the geometry of the structure using a concept called Vesper theory. Now, Vesper theory stands for this, the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Okay, sounds complicated. Not very complicated, though. The central idea is that if you are looking at valence electrons, right, negative charges, remember, electrons are negative, they want to repel each other and get as far away from each other in a molecule as possible. And that's what the electron pair repulsion here means. In other words, if a molecule is trying to uh, form the lowest energy state possible for it, it's going to want to position its atoms as far apart as possible to minimize the fact that we have these negative things that are going to be repelling. And so you can think about it again, it's a competition. And so they're definitely going to want to have their uh, highly electric or electronegative uh, atoms as far apart from each other as possible. So electrons take up a lot of space, and so they push atoms physically apart from each other, leading to different configurations. And that leads to our next point, which is the shapes that you get because these electrons are pushing a lot are kind of geometric, and they're, they're very skewed in certain aspects, right? So if we were looking at this molecule, this is kind of what NH3 uh, would look like. You have your nitrogen, you have your three hydrogens, and then you have this invisible you know, pair of electrons that is pushing these hydrogens down. 
and you don't even see them because remember electrons are tiny and they are zipping around and moving and warping from one place to another. So you really can't see them, but you can feel the effects of them. And atoms feel the effects of them all the time. And that leads to the geometries. And geometries just means, you know, the shape or the different shapes that these molecules can have. And that leads to different angles. And so if we're looking at the distance uh, between these two, uh, there is a particular angle between those atoms that we can look at and we can quantify. So first thing. This will be your savior, and this is just for things that follow the octet rule, okay? So we've got uh, these shapes, and yeah, they have kind of like weird names, but the key here is that the letter in the middle here, E, that is your central atom. X, these are your outer atoms, and then these little dots are the lone pairs of electrons that are on your central atom. Notice it doesn't matter how many lone pairs are on the outside, it only matters how many lone pairs are on your central atom. The rest of it doesn't matter. A lot of times people ask, what the heck are these little things? They're just trying to make it three-dimensional looking. Okay, so these little things are coming out towards you. The ones with the dashes are going behind you, but they're still just lines. They are bonds. That's it. Okay, and another little fact, if there are only two atoms, it has to be flat. It has to be linear. There's no other shape that you can possibly have if you have two atoms next to each other. So let's try to do this, right? I have CH4. If I were to draw this the way we've been drawing it, do your best, right? Draw your geometry um, the way we've been drawing it. And let's take a look and see if we can figure out which one of these CH4 would represent. So if I were to draw it, I would draw it like this, right? I've got my four atoms. So think about this, right? I have a central atom. I have four outer atoms like this. Which one of these actually fits that description? Now notice, this is flat. These are in 3D or trying to be in 3D. It would be this one, tetrahedral, right? I have a central atom, that's carbon. You can imagine these X's are hydrogens all along the outside. So how would I draw this if I were trying to draw this accurately? This is actually what CH4 looks like. Notice I have a carbon, I have my four hydrogens and they are spread out. I have 109.5 degrees. And yeah, it says 109, but it's 109.5 if we're being extremely accurate and precise. What about H2O, right? Draw H2O. How do we normally draw H2O if we're drawing it in dot structure-wise? You draw it flat like this. So a lot of times people are like, oh, look, huh, right here. I can see it. It looks like that. But remember, appearances can be deceiving. I have a central atom, I have two outer atoms, and I have two lone pairs of electrons. This does not have any lone pairs of electrons on it. It can't be this one. Which one is it? There's only one shape that has two lone pairs of electrons on the central atom. Again, you can say that's your oxygen, these are your hydrogens, and you have your two lone pairs of electrons. It would be bent or angular, right? So if I were to actually draw it, my bent-shaped water, it would actually look like this. And see, it says much, much less than 109 degrees, and that's definitely, the distance between these two is definitely way less than 109. Last one, pH3, right? If I were to draw this, try drawing it just flat like we're used to drawing them. Look like this, right? You've got your phosphorus, you've got your hydrogens, you've got your lone pair of electrons. And again, a lot of people would look at this and they'd be say, oh, it looks like, oh, it doesn't look like any of these. And that's again, because you drew it flat. We have to think about how this actually works. Which of these geometries do you think best fits it? You really have two choices, right? You have two things that have one lone pair of electrons. It can either be this one or it can be that one. Notice this only has two outer atoms. This one has three outer atoms. And obviously we have three outer atoms. It's pH three, not pH two. So how should I draw this and what is the geometry? The geometry is right here. It's tri trigonal pyramid or trigonal pyramidal sometimes is what they are called. Um, and notice, again, I have my P here, my phosphorus, and I've got my hydrogens. This is a lone pair of electrons and it's pushing these down. So this is what it would look like in three dimensions. Again, less than 109 degrees. 93.5, that's definitely less than 109 degrees. And that's what that would look like. Okay? So again, do your best when you're trying to draw these Lewis dot structures. Um, you can draw them flat just like we've been doing, but then you have to be able to use this Vesper chart to be able to figure out what it actually would look like. And if it asks you to draw it accurately, this is how you would be drawing things accurately. Okay? So hopefully that made sense. And if you have any questions, you can ask me in class.